Hello and welcome back to YCMR webinar series. My name is Valentina Puntman and today I would like to introduce you to the role of CMR in hypertrophic cardiac conditions. This webinar will be delivered in two parts. In part one, we will review the definition of left ventricular hypertrophy as well as the measures to describe it. Among the common conditions, we will review those that result in hypertrophic phenotype due to pressure or volume overload. Hereditary conditions, as well as cardiac infiltration, will be reviewed separately in part two. Cardiac hypertrophy stands for abnormal enlargement or thickening of the heart muscle, which is led either by increase in cardiomyocyte size or increase in extracellular matrix remodeling. This slide outlines the measures that are employed in description of cardiac hypertrophy, including left ventricular wall thickness, LV mass and LV volume, all measured in diastole. Standard measurements of wall thickness mirror the approaches that are routinely employed in echocardiography. Measurements are obtained in three-chamber view, which is an equivalent of parasternal long-axis view in transthoracic echocardiography. Measurements are obtained in basal anteroceptal and basal inferolateral segment, perpendicular to the long axis continuity of left ventricular wall, corresponding to a rather old-fashioned and yet persistent echo nomenclature, denoting thickness of interventricular septum as well as left ventricular posterior wall, respectively. Measurement of more than 12 mm of either of the two signifies an abnormally increased left ventricular wall thickness. Increase in LV wall thickness can be non-homogeneous in distribution, that is, more pronounced in certain parts of the ventricle compared to the others. A useful measure in such cases is maximal LV wall thickness defined as the greatest measurement anywhere within the left ventricle, most intuitively presented in a bull's eye based on a 16-segment AHA model. And lastly, the measurement of LV volume and mass, which is performed by epicardial and endocardial contouring using a complete short-axis stack. The resulting measurements include end-diastolic volume, and systolic volume, as well as diastolic LV mass. These measurements also reflect the state of concomitant myocardial remodeling. Just a quick note on post-processing approaches of LV mass with regards to inclusion or exclusion of papillary muscles. Papillary muscles would traditionally be included as a part of the blood pool. That means excluded from the direct measurement of LV mass. This approach was developed to approximate the established practice in transthoracic echocardiography and is underscored by a wealth of accumulated prognostic and therapeutic evidence. As new post-processing methods are being developed, papillary muscles can now also be accounted directly as part of the LV mass. This may help to improve the accuracy of LV mass assessment, which appears to be particularly relevant in hypertrophic hearts. There is this interesting thing about pressure or volume overload hypertrophy. The striking phenotypical changes, to a greater extent, correspond to physiological responses to a greater demand, which, however, with persistence and time, result in myocardial injury, marking a transition from a compensated hypertrophy into cardiomyopathic or pathologic stage of disease. Pressure overloads such as in chronic hypertension, aortic stenosis or coarctation results primarily in an increase in ventricular wall thickness. In volume overload, the predominant morphological change is increase in LV diameter. Volume overload is physiologically encountered in exercise or pregnancy and pathologically in regurgitant valvular disease. Arterial hypertension is one of the most common causes of pressure overload hypertrophy. In this example of three short-axis slices, that is, apical, mid and basal, 
one can appreciate that the increase in left ventricular wall thickness is uniform across all 16 segments of the left ventricle, which is descriptive of concentric hypertrophy. Aortic stenosis due to a tight aortic valve is another example of pressure overload hypertrophy, which again most commonly results in a concentric increase in left ventricular wall thickness. And here is an example of volume overload condition, aortic regurgitation, which is primarily characterized by an increase in left ventricular diameter, with a consequent stretch in left ventricle, leading to increase in left ventricular volumes as well as left ventricular mass. This switch into decompensation, or the time point when physiological adaptation becomes pathological decompensation, and is characterized by the processes of coping with myocardial injury, remains a subject of great debate as well as intense research. On pathophysiological level, it is understood that it involves a move away from increase in cell size towards increase in extracellular matrix remodeling, and consequently a build-up of myocardial fibrosis. This is considered a final common pathway of cardiomyopathic remodeling of the heart, which involves initial accumulation of diffuse interstitial fibrosis and with time transition into confluent regionalized replacement fibrosis or SCAR. Myocardial fibrosis imaging is one of the many strengths of cardiovascular magnetic resonance. Using T1 mapping and late gadolinium enhancement, it is able to detect interstitial and replacement fibrosis respectively. In arterial hypertension, Late gadolinium enhancement or replacement fibrosis is an uncommon feature of a compensated hypertensive left ventricular hypertrophy. If present, it can be ischemic or non-ischemic. Non-ischemic type of late gadolinium enhancement is commonly non-specific, without predilection site and without a particular relationship with left ventricular remodeling. Alternatively, the pattern can be ischemic, subendocardial, and relates to concomitant coronary artery disease, for which hypertension is a recognized risk factor. We've also shown that diffuse interstitial fibrosis is an uncommon feature of compensated hypertensive hypertrophy, with values of native T1 and ECV not dissimilar from those of controls. In severe aortic stenosis, the predominant pattern of late gadolinium enhancement is non-ischemic, visualized as intramyocardial or mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement with predilection site to basal segments. As shown in this observational study of patients with severe aortic stenosis, this finding is important as it is predictive of all-cause mortality together with reduced ejection fraction and subsequent aortic valve replacement surgery. This finding was reproduced in a later study in patients undergoing valve replacement, showing that the presence of late gadolinium enhancement and non-ischemic type in particular was predictive of a poorer post-operative outcome. Identifying mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement as an important stratifier of patients undergoing aortic valve replacement. A number of T1 mapping studies revealed increased T1 values in patients with aortic stenosis, which correlated with histologically derived collagen volume fraction, or in other words, the amount of interstitial fibrosis signifying underlying burden of diffuse myocardial disease. Studies with T1 mapping indices in patients with aortic stenosis informing on a relationship with outcome are not yet available. In the part 1 of this webinar on hypertrophic cardiac conditions, we've reviewed the definition of left ventricular hypertrophy as well as the measures to describe it. Based on the examples of pressure and volume overload hypertrophy, we've reviewed the role for myocardial fibrosis imaging by cardiovascular magnetic resonance. And here comes a list of literature that I have used in preparation of this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and I would like to thank you for your attention.